Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. Our guest host today is Nick Wilkie from the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. Welcome, Nick. Good to be here, Mark. Good to have you back on here. Who are your guests today? Today, uh, my very special guest is going to be Kiana Lehman. She is my, uh, she, my co-worker at the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. And our topic for the day is going to be accessibility, specifically at this time of year where, where uh, the white stuff on the ground is such a, such a wonderful thing that we have to deal with. Right. So we've got a variety of questions and some scenarios around that. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, great. I'm busy today. I have two special guests. We have uh, three guests from Walk-On uh, Therapeutic Horseback Riding in Wisconsin, which we'd like to thank Warren Lynch from Osmond Shrine for bringing those guests here today, transporting them. Secondly, I have uh, Chris Sears from the Star Tribune, who is talking about a article on costly isolation for and people in, in group homes. So that should be uh, uh, pretty good and timely. So we're looking forward to all that and more today on Disability Viewpoints. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes and th in this segment we're going to learn about therapeutic horseback riding. And uh, these guests were kind enough to come down here to our studios today thanks to Warren Lynch from St. Paul Osmond Shrine that brought our, uh, two of the guests here fr from all three of you from, uh, from Wisconsin. So we have uh, Kim Van Ork, Jane Bradford, and Ken Geske as our guests. And I'm going to let them take a couple minutes to tell them a little bit about ourselves before we get going on our interview here. So Ken, we'll start with you. Well, thank you for having us, Mark. You're welcome. Um, we actually, my wife and I, started our therapeutic riding program, Walk On Therapeutic Horseback Riding, in 2001, mm -hmm. and the night before 9-11, September 10th, with five mm -hmm. riders and 15 volunteers. Mm -hmm. And we've been going strong ever since. Um, we, we are the founders, and ex I'm the executive director, as well as one of the paths. That means riders. you're the boss, then? Well, sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, executive director and path certified instructor with our organization. Mm -hmm. um, we've been going strong ever since. We are located between River Falls and Hammond, Wisconsin. Great. And we are a 501-3C nonprofit organization. Good, good, good for you. Jane Bradford, tell us a little about yourself and welcome. So I am an instructor at Walk-On. I'm certified as a therapeutic riding instructor. I'm also certified as an equine specialist in mental health and learning. Mm -hmm. And um, as well as teaching at Walk-On, I run our Horses for Heroes program at my farm, which is three miles away and from our main And you do something in music, too. I, yep, I teach music and run a church music program on the side. Do you so. have time to sleep and eat? No Not much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kim Van Ark, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank tell you. Us, tell us what you want us to know. Um, well, I am also a therapeutic riding instructor. Um, That's what you do. <laughs> yeah. And you do it well, right? Yes. And you yeah. guys are mother and daughter. Indeed. Yes. Yep. Okay. So the first question we had to have today is, uh, what are the benefits of therapeutic horseback riding? And maybe all three of you want to give an opinion on it. So. Well, first of all, I'll start with part of that question answering. Um, when you look at therapeutic horseback riding, <clears throat> we work, we look at four components. One is the sport itself, one is the education benefit, the therapy benefit, and the recreational benefit. And where all three of those components come together, right in the middle where those four circles merge, that's where the therapeutic rec riding is at. Very good. We've seen riders that have um, noted improvement, like in core muscle. We have riders that improve strength and balance and coordination. 
we have riders who have spoken their first words on right. horses. One particular rider in mind and his first words is he came to us and his mother said, you know, we've never heard him speak anything intentional. He makes noises, but we're not sure he means it. Um, and the first intentional words this kiddo spoke were walk on, telling his horse to walk on. Great. Yeah. As a disabled rider, I, I also, I, I, I know what it takes to, what it takes, what it takes to do it. Um, Great. As an infant, I had two open, uh, open heart surgeries. Oh. Um, and it was, it was, it was a really big challenge for me to come back and start riding from that. Great. Is there, there must be a prerequisite that people have to uh, be able to do so much to get up on a horse and ride, as opposed to some people, have you had to turn away because they could or couldn't do it? Um, there are prerequisites. So we, first of all, we, pat, we follow the PATH International standards, and there we go between the ages of four years at the youngest on up. There are some programs, including ours, there's with weight limits, and that's for the right. comfort of the horse. Right. Mm -hmm. And with that, we go through an evaluation process prior to them riding, and once we've gone through that evaluation process, we determine, yes, they can ride, and then they start with our programming. Great. Great. Jane, what has been your, your, probably your most memorable experience with this therapeutic horseback riding. Well, now that's pretty hard. <laughs> that's really hard. Yeah. Um, so you heard Kim mention some. Kim w did have a couple of heart surgeries and a major brain injury. Right. And that was really what set me on this path of getting right. going. So um, when I first put her on a horse, I was not a therapeutic instructor <coughs> at the time. But over the years, that that came down the road. And what but what age was that? When I became when certified? no when you put. Oh, I put her on a horse when she was three. Good. Um, I, I had horses and I wanted her to ride. Mm -hmm. So over the years, the things that, um, that Kim was able to accomplish because she was mm -hmm. riding, we, mm -hmm. we show horses. We showed to the national level. Right. We had the 2014 um, Therapy mm -hmm. Horse of the Year on mm -hmm. the Morgan Circuit. Um, but I think the so many times to watch Kim, who'd had a major brain injury, find a way that she could succeed. And then for her to go forward and become a therapeutic instructor was um, yeah. was a really big deal in this mom's life. That so. success <laughs> feels pretty good, doesn't it? It does. That's a major it accomplishment. Does. What What has been your major accomplishment with the program, Kim? Basically helping the, helping the other riders out. Mm -hmm. um, being, an, being an instructor mm -hmm. as well as, as, a, as a volunteer I've realized that, that it does take a lot of energy and a lot of time mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah, that's probably true, right? Mm -hmm. It takes yeah. a lot of time and energy to volunteer. And then you do if you're going to do a first class job. And without seeing it, I know you do, but I watched the video, so I know you do. Uh, how can someone volunteer for Walk On? That's another component to the operation. Well, we have a website. We have an email address. <clears throat> we have phone numbers. They just contact. Do you want to give those? Um, yeah, I'd like you to give them twice in case people don't have a okay. paper and pen when they're watching. So we well, do it twice. We'll do the phone number first. Right. That's 715-425-2025. I'll say it again. 715-425-2025. Our email address is very simply walkontherapeuticriding at gmail.com. Okay. And uh, Jane, what has been your experience with Walk On? Um, I started teaching there, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And um, it's, I call it my happy place. <laughs> Great. Um, kind of talked about the benefit to the riders, but. Um, it's always a reset button for me. If Great. I've had a stressful day someplace else, to come in and see riders who um, are making a monumental effort to get there okay. and, and are working so hard at overcoming whatever challenge they have, um, that um, 
really puts perspective on yeah, anything else that I'm dealing goal, with. Have a yep. Final question, we're, we're getting down on time, but Horses for Heroes program, can you tell me briefly how that works? Yeah, so I'm the director yeah. of that program and that is geared to serve um, veterans and active duty military as well as law enforcement and all first responders and their families. Great. So any kind of uh, mental, physical, relational challenge, we have resources in place to come alongside them and um, work, help them work through whatever they're struggling with. Great, great. Well, I, I wish this program the best success. Nice to have you all here. Thank you. Thank Welcome, you so much. everybody. And uh, well, again, we want to thank Warren Lynch from St. Paul Osmond Shrine for making it possible to transport these folk, fine folks down here today. And we'll be back with more disability viewpoints in just a moment. Hello, my name is Nick Wilkie. I'm your co host for uh, Disability Viewpoints in this segment. Uh, with me today is Kiana Lehman. Kiana has been my colleague at the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living for uh, almost, is it how oh. many years? Oh, it's how many years? Five years, four months about? You're counting the months. Hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. I brought Kiana on the show today uh, because um, we want to talk about a subject that's very important this time of year around uh, accessibility specifically in the winter time. What has been your, your overall experience with access, especially this time of year? Uh, I travel by light rail bus and public transportation most of the time. I don't own my own vehicle, so um, it's hard to get around. Most people don't shovel out curb cuts, so I can't maneuver. Right. right on my own in the cities. Right. One, one of the things that I always note as someone with a disability as well, um, even when trying to find parking, um, a lot of times the disability spots are either full of snow or inaccessible. Yep. Like, so you can't, you can't park where you want to park because it's piled full of snow. Um, yes. As you know, as you just mentioned, we've got treacherous paths impassable mounds of snow. Um, for my circumstances, I'm physically cold, so my body doesn't function the way that I need it to, to, to oh, move. Oh yeah, I, I know right? that very well too. Right? I was stuck on the light rail in my wheelchair three times. Not stuck on the train, stuck on the light rail tracks. I was trying to cross the street, but then once I got to the light rail tracks, I got stuck. I had to holler help. That, that brings us to another point that I wanted to mention. Like the fact that like advocating for help and trying to get the help that you need just to have access can be super, super frustrating because yes. um, you, might have to, you might have to tell people three or four times about the access issue before, before somebody finally takes notice. I find that personally personally frustrating as well. Yes, it is. I mean, I've lived in my neighborhood for 12 years and right. it's still unaccessible. And I mean, I have a nursing home and senior living right two blocks away from me, three blocks away from me. How is the neighborhood not accessible? Right. I just don't and understand that. Remind our viewers again, Kiana, how, how long have you been using different, um, different modes of accessibility where you would need um, well, access to the corners Well, it's been, like what, well, I was diagnosed with MS in December 18, 2002, and I've been using accessible mobility devices, whether it be a wheelchair, a walker, or something, right. since I was 18 years yeah. old, and I'm 35 now, yep. so, so 18 no, years. Nothing new. Nothing new. So, I mean, again, Year after year, having to advocate for the same stuff. Always having to advocate same for the stuff. exact same thing. Definitely. Um, and again, sometimes finding service opportunities to help you can be challenging. What do you think are the best ways to confront these challenges that we keep talking about? Just keep bringing it up. Just keep talking right. about it. Just make it a normal thing so everyone can think it's normal. Right. To clear out a curb cut. 
just so I can cross the street to go right. from point A to point B. Getting those. It's simple. Getting those sidewalk shoveled. The sidewalk shovel. On a regular basis. More than just the shovel with. Yeah. A part. We were talking about that too. Yeah. If you just do one shovel width wide, like no, there's no nothing like, is that narrow. I can't walk a straight line to save my life. Uh, nope, right? haven't been able to do that for years. Right. What's a straight me, line, me Nick? Me it, it, both of us. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I also find that one of the biggest things is being able to uh, being able to, to have people that actually get to know what it's like for us getting a route or to see us, you know, make it, but to kind of struggle through. Oh, yes. You know? I wish we could do like a game show. Be in my life for one day right. in the winter. Exactly. Let's see you do this simple task. Totally. totally. How fun is this? How easy is this? Can you do it? Right. Can you not? Every mm. day. <laughs> yeah. Every day. I do this every day, 24 hours a day. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to share, because we've got a colleague that couldn't make it with yes, us today. Yes, yes. So he couldn't be with us today, but he wanted to um, share some sentiment. He pulled a quote from um, the Minnesota Council on Disabilities Facebook page. In a recent post, they, they, they said, and, in a, and I quote, um, encourage people to clear their sidewalk. Be the reason someone can do all the things that they need to be done. And David goes on to say, he thinks that part of the issue is that there's still a stigma about disability and many people do not expect us, being people with disabilities, to be contributing members of society that need to leave the house to go to work, run errands. It's in people's best interest to remove the snow so we can be out supporting businesses, working, and just contributing to society in general. There are plenty of unavoidable challenges with getting around in the winter. but poor snow removal is completely avoidable. Yes. So we know this all too well. All too well. Kiana, I want to I wanna thank you for being on with me. It's been a pleasure. Um, for now, this is Nick Wilkie signing off. Disability Viewpoints will be back in just a few moments. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. With me is Nick Wilkie from the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. And he's our co-host today. And then on, on the other end is Chris Sears, a well-known reporter from the Star Tribune. And we're going to talk today about a recent article in the Star Tribune called Costly Isolation. So we'll begin there. And Chris, we'll let you introduce yourself and then go ahead and talk about the report you did. Well, Mark, thank you for having me. It's, it's always an honor to be on this You're show, welcome. which I think is a tremendous public service You're welcome. and um, I write for the Star Tribune and uh, I write about social services and disability issues and uh, we did have a story in, in Sunday Star Tribune which was really the fourth story in a series we're doing about uh, Medicaid spending in Minnesota so early this year we decided we wanted to do a deep dive into how we spend and allocate about three billion dollars in Medicaid funds every year mm -hmm. for people with disabilities. And you can't really do that without looking at, at group homes. Uh, not many people realize this, but um, about two thirds of our Medicaid waiver spending in this state, about 1.5 billion goes towards group homes. And Minnesota has more people with disabilities in group homes mm -hmm. as a percentage of our population than any other state in the nation. So we're really wedded to this model. So we decided, starting in the summer, let's travel the state and let's visit these group homes. Let's get an idea of you know, what's the lived experience of people who are in these, um, in these facilities. And I think what we, what we found is, in many cases, it's, this may not be a huge surprise to people here today, but these facilities can be very isolating. Uh, we found that, uh, in many cases, people were not being taken on outings in, into the community. <coughs> they were uh, being kept in the same place for hours at a time. They weren't, they, they didn't have full access to the community. And so really the, the topic of the story that we, we did over the weekend was really looking at that lived experience. What is it like to be isolated right. in a group home? 
And I, what are the rights that people have? I think the, the, the fact of the matter is that we've now uncovered in the story that the people's lives in the group home aren't their own, they're directed. That's and right. that's, you know, whether they help you with the decisions that everybody makes in that group home or not, they're directed. And uh, that's just a different way of life. And I think you've uncovered that in this article. The whole article was great. It talked about percents. You went to some of the adm administrators. Uh, it would be interesting to hear from Governor Walls himself. I think mm -hmm. it's that big issue and carries that magnitude that, you know, somebody should at least uh, see if we can't get some time with the governor and uh, go from there, but that's up to you. Well, I think that um, that plays into another recent story that we just saw is we had um, Governor Walls actually did a day in the life of a, of a personal care attendant just, a, just uh, about 10 days ago. So we're, we're getting exposure on a number of different levels now. Oh, yeah. um, and the, the in-depth reporting just kind of um, really gets people to you know, step into the shoes of the people in these situations. Well, I, I think that's right. And it's important to realize we, we shouldn't assume that people in power know what's going on yeah. no. uh, in group homes or, or know what's, you know, what the daily lived experience is of, of people who are getting care in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think it's our duty to, to, to get those stories out mm -hmm. in, in, in public. And our point is not that all group homes are bad. Mm -hmm. I think our point is that people need to, to be told what their options are. Right. You know, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't realize uh, we interviewed people that had been in the same group home for 10, even 13 years without ever being told that their Medicaid funds could be used to support right. Right. Uh, th their lives in their own apartment, in their own homes. Right. And so there are creative things you can do with the Medicaid budgets right. that aren't being done because people aren't being informed of their options. Well, in, in this case here, I read in the article that he, this person was in a group home the mother took him back home for a while, right. and that was that was clear run out because of the things you just mentioned. And we've got a few minutes to go, so if you want to bring out some other important points in this article or the whole series, go right ahead. Well, I think that that we, we you know clearly we would like to give people an idea of you know what can we d do in this state to make things better, and our next story is actually going to be focused on the whole self-directed model of care. Right. where you get your own budget and you get to choose what services you want mm -hmm. without any kind of agency interference, county interference, any sort of middleman. And really, actually, it's interesting, but we're finding that Wisconsin, our neighbor actually, has the most innovative self-directed program in the nation. Cool. So our next story coming up in a few weeks is really going to be highlighting the Wisconsin model, and hopefully um, that might help. Uh, get I, I think we've learned too in, in Ramsey County that Dakota County is coming up with some new programs for the disabled. So a lot of the disabled folks are pulling up stakes and moving to Dakota County, which isn't a bad place, you know. That's and right. you got to go where the best fit is for you. And I think that's what we'll discover in the next story on the Star Tribune. So, um, what was the biggest eye opener in this story here for you, Chris? I think for me, the biggest eye opener was visiting people in group homes and finding out just how isolating their lives were. Mm -hmm. You know, I always try to think of it from my own experience and what I would want for myself. And I can't imagine mm -hmm. being kept in a, in a facility for months at a time without any opportunity uh, to you know, to see friends or to volunteer or to play sports or to go out, you know, um, to go out at night. And to meet people that never have those opportunities was really striking to me. And, and to me, that was what really, really concerned me. Yeah. The other thing I, that really concerned me also is just the amount of money we're spending on group homes. I mean, it's $1.5 billion a year in the state. And, you know, what we found is that group homes cost, on average, Four times more mm -hmm. than if you spent than if you than if someone lives in their own apartment or their own home. Right. So we, I think we have to look at this from uh, uh, the standpoint of is this the best bang for our buck? Well, and then, like you mentioned before, Chris, like are are the people that are 
living in those situations, are they given the opportunity to make that, kind of have that conversation annually, every couple of years? You know, do you like your experience now? Would you like to see about other opportunities? I mean, just being able to make that choice. Well, and if, um, if you're the parent, if you have a son or daughter, that's right. your two lives are involved. Right. Because you're directing the thing as a parent, but obviously you want most of the time what's best for your kids. And, right. That's right. and it's, it's really difficult in a, in, a, in, a, in a group home. You know, the other group home would be better, but doesn't offer service we need, so we gotta come to plan B, and that's right. really tough. We're, we're getting down to a, about a minute, so I wanna do the final, any final thoughts on this article is very good. I would just hope that, you know, people uh, in power <coughs> take another look at this model. Uh, you know, group homes were, I think, uh, a great idea at the time in the 1980s as a way to move people out of the large institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, but we've become wedded to this model um, ever since, and, right. and I think it's time to revisit whether okay. it's it, whether we're too wedded to it. Take a look at what's working, what's not. Sure. So at this time, we'd like to thank Chris Sears from the Star Tribune. Mark, great, thank you. A great article again. We'll look Good forward to, to your you, next sir. article coming out, and we'll see you next time on on uh, disability viewpoints when we'll try to take a good look at the uh, legislative session that's coming right up. So. We'll be back with more disability viewpoints in just a second. Hey, Nick, who were your guests today? Today, today my guests were uh, Kiana Lehman. Uh, we were on talking about accessibility and how that changes this time of year. Um, so, as you know, Mark, we will continue to talk about that's, that subject. Uh, that's very important. We have a you lot know. of those kind of months coming up, so we do. It'll it'll be important. We Today, do. I had uh, walk-on therapeutic horses from Wisconsin. Again, uh, Warren Lynch from St. Paul Osmer Shrine was uh, responsible for the transportation. We thank him for that. Yeah, there were horse stuff about horses today that I'm, I've learned. I haven't gone much beyond dogs, so that's pretty good. Then we had a well-known reporter from the Star Tribune. Chris Sears, who recently did an article on isolation of people in group homes that was very, very good. And today, or at this time, happens to be his birthday. So happy birthday, Chris, and we brought you a little something. Mark, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I, well, I can't imagine a better place the to whole, be on my birthday than here. Well, there you go. The so, whole entire so team did this, so we don't want, I don't want you to think that I just did it. Though everybody in here had Well, thank you to, to your whole team, and yeah. you're doing a tremendous public service. And this cake looks really good. Well, very good. So we'll see you next time on Disability Viewpoints when Chris Sears will probably unwrap the 2020 legislative session for us. And we'll have other things going on too, so we hope you join us next time on Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes for the entire team. Bye for now. <laughs>